Dear listeners, welcome back to this latest episode of the podcast series, The Way Out is In. I am Joe Confino, working at the intersection of personal transformation and systems evolution. And I'm Brother Fab Hu, a Zen Buddhist monk, student of Zen Master Tikkenhan in the Plum Village tradition. And Brother, you have just come back from a session which in Plum Village is called Shining Light, which is a way of giving feedback to the monastics so that you can learn together, grow together and understand each other better. So today we're going to explore the practice of Shining Light. The way out is in. Hello everyone, I'm Joe Confino. And I'm Brother Fab Hu. And as I said, Brother, we are going to experience today what shining light is. Now, um, when I was uh, working, I used to get uh, an annual feedback so this was called uh, 360 feedback, and I would um, basically send out a form to uh, eight colleagues, both people above me and below me, and uh, they would fill in certain questions. Those questions would be anonymized, and they would go back to a trainer, and then I would meet with that consultant, and they would take me back through the, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So it was individual. I only knew it myself. No one else knew about it. I got no public feedback. It was all anonymized. And then the feedback, as I said, was given by someone who didn't work for the company, but was paid for their services. Is that what you do in Plum Village with Shining Light? Not exactly. But there are some elements there, like the 360, but we do it collectively. And we use what we call the Sangha I. So do you want to tell us what is the difference? And well, maybe let's start off, what's the purpose of it? And how often do you do it? Thank you, Joe. Um, this practice called Shining Light, we do it once a year as um, a practice for all the monastic community. And in Plum Village here, we have three different hamlets. So New Hamlet, Lower Hamlet, and Upper Hamlet. And we would uh, do it in our individual hamlets because we live together, we work together, we practice together, and we serve together. So therefore, we have 365 days of a collective awareness of individuals' uh, way of being. So we have more clarity. So this practice here, it is quite intimate, and there has to be enough understanding and enough presence um, throughout the year. We have to have enough time to really practice this. And we do it once a year as a way to offer very concrete and practical awareness and feedback. And we call it shining light because in our practice of mindfulness, mindfulness is to observe, is to be aware, and it is to support. So as the community developed and grew throughout the years in Plum Village. Tai had many more students through the years and Tai wouldn't have enough time to offer guidance and individual feedback um, um, every year. And the, as the monastic grew bigger and larger, um, Tai also needed to rely on his monastic students to also support him in offering the guidance. So this, for me, this practice um, has really developed a sense of caring for one another and the responsibility of supporting one another in, like you said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> but we use different languages. <laughs> for example, um, the good, we would say we would like to take the opportunity to shine the light on the flowers of individuals, like the the qualities that they have within them that generates a lot of 
joy and happiness for themselves, but also generate joy and happiness for the community, or even on an individual basis, like on friendship, on um, siblinghood, um, as well as when we look into an individual's practice, we also know none of us is perfect. So we have the mud. So we have the lotuses and we have the mud that we can shine the light on. But whenever we shine the light on a mud, we also have to um, concretely share a suggestion or a looking deeply. So we have to be very mindful in these sessions. We've heard about beginning a new practice in Plum Village. It is not a practice where we are digging into somebody's like shortcoming. Then that becomes a session of just criticizing each other. Then that be I we would consider that a failure of a session because then that becomes um, very heavy as well as not productive. And Throughout this session, when we shine light for one, we also get to realize that we're also shining light for ourselves as we are offering input. Because a lot of the times, what we think is beautiful and unbeautiful, it comes from our own perception and what we like inside of us. Um, so it's a really, it's a very deep looking practice. So it is, it is, um, Vipassana. It is like looking deeply. And we would have enough time for the community to know who is being shined light on the coming week. So we have time to reflect on that person. And in a community like ours, where like in the brothers, we have, um, I think this range, which we have 50 something brothers. And not everyone has the opportunity to really know one individual. So I really enjoy going to these sessions um, just to hear the shining light from the community on an individual because I can learn so much more about that person by the awareness of other members. So it is like a study. It's a deep study. And when you listen to the shining light of one individual, you can also learn just by observing as well as just by your presence of listening. So, brother, um, I know that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh developed a text in order to read out um, before each session, in order to centre and also to really give clear guidance. So do you want to maybe uh, tell us why Thich Nhat Hanh wrote the text and then maybe read the text so listeners can actually understand um, what actually the process is? Yes, very happy to share about this. Um, when I first came into the community as a monk when I ordained in 2002, the practice of shining light uh, has already been established, but it was in the more er early forms. And this shows the beauty of a living community and a living tradition because the early days, this practice wasn't yet um, created in our community. But like I shared, the practice of shining light, when we practice on ourselves and we cultivate these practices, we may think that we are doing everything correctly. Um, but as we are human beings, we have shortcomings and we have blind spots. So this practice is also to shine the light where we as an individual may not be able to see it, but because we live in a community where there is a 360 view, but even deeper, we can see inside because we get to listen to each other throughout the year. So sometimes we get to hear each other's um, story and habits and behaviors and attitude are also manifested throughout the year due to each individual's journey, whether um, they have deep suffering that they are still working on or some individual are just so pleasant and we need to learn like how they cultivate these these qualities where it's so beneficial for so many. So the early days when when I first came into the community, so in our table today recording, we have Joe, we have Nick as our sound engineer and myself. Let's say we're going to shine light on Nick. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the early day, Nick wouldn't be present in that shining light session. And then the 
the community would then um let we would then put nick in our uh, our mind and from our experience in the in the year we would then offer our input and what i've learned is that when that person is not there we can become very critical about that person it's so easy to look at the negative and sometimes you a person may have held on to that view for a whole year or two years or three years and then in this moment when it's okay we get to like like shine light on nick i'm going to give it everything and then our speech become not kind and not constructive and it's just blaming and that and that and brother that's very much like social media isn't it that when it's anonymized when the when you don't see the person sitting in front of you it's very much easier for the mind to be critical so actually you're saying something very similar there exactly and when that person is not there you you just feel like you're speaking to your own perception about that person mm. right and there's not real responsibility from the individual in offering that person guidance but it's very different when that person is in the room so after some reports uh, our teacher heard about this and i remember receiving a letter and not knowing what to expect so so you mean everyone would discuss the person and then they would the, that person would then receive a letter from the community exactly right, okay, so right. it's kind of like a report card in yeah. a way and we normally end our rains retreat with a ceremony um called um invitation um and it's part of the in, the shining light so at the end of the rains retreat every monastic would receive their shining light letter it's kind of like our like this is the ticket out of the rains retreat <laughs> <laughs> that you yeah, good luck to that you. you that you um you were present you listen you practice and and this letter is for you to observe and reflect for the coming year for you to have a pathway to develop oneself so the intention is very good but then our teacher recognized that this kind of practice it doesn't support our other very foundational practice of community building which is deep listening and loving speech so our teacher then renewed this dhamma door and he said uh every shining light session the individual has to be present and then our teacher wrote a text for us to contemplate before every session and i would like to read yeah, it yeah great thank you meditation on offering guidance lord buddha and teachers over many generations today we have a chance to practice offering guidance to our brothers sisters and friends We know that in spirit we are all part of one sangha that our flesh and bones are also part of one sangha therefore we are aware that offering guidance to another is offering guidance to ourselves we vow to use all of our love and understanding in order to practice offering guidance we promise that every word we speak will come from the good intention of wanting to have a correct view about the person to whom guidance is being offered we vow not to let our anger sadness and prejudice wrongly influence our opinion we promise that every word we speak will come from love because offering guidance to one is also offering guidance to many we are aware that this practice will offer benefits to each of us dear buddha and ancestral teachers please support us in our wholehearted effort to successfully offer guidance today hmm beautiful thank you brother so what's coming to my mind is that feedback can either create division or it can bind people together so uh, just going back to uh, my history at the guardian so i actually brought in the feedback system into the garden because uh, before i brought that in there was no feedback at all and so people were often just uncertain how they were doing they didn't get they often weren't praised for the things that they were doing well they didn't get feedback when things weren't going very well and then when things didn't go very well people often felt excluded 
that people would just keep them to the side rather than be honest. There was a complete lack of honesty. But often too much honesty without care can be hurtful. And there was one uh, editor of one of the big departments and uh, we experimented in this person, in his department, first of all, and all the feedback forms came back and there was not one positive thing they said about this person. And this was 12 people giving the feedback and they all came back with very serious sort of criticisms. And that person was very much destroyed and actually a short while later sort of stood down as the editor of that department. So that was a real lesson for me in, firstly, the anonymity, and secondly, the fact that they didn't start off, there was no process for starting off with the positive things. It was, it was just, people could just say whatever they want. So what, a couple of questions that come from this Brother Fepu is, the reason it was anonymized, and it is in every company, pretty much every company I know, there's, there's, I've never heard of a, an organization where there's this community building aspect. Um, and I think they do that because of uh, a fear of being embarrassed, humiliated, being exposed, that actually the only way you're going to change is if you have the safety to hear that um, in your own private space, no one else is going to hear it. And you're doing exactly the opposite. So how can you do it in a way that actually, because there might be a wish to build community, but that person, how do, how do you build the presence and, and, and holding that space so that if you're giving some feedback that that person might find difficult, that they're genuinely able to hear it in front of everybody? That sounds quite a stretch for some people. It truly is. But the beauty, if we are really coming together to to develop a community and cultivate a community that there is understanding and there is um, trust. Honesty is a big part of that. And it sounds scary. And, and, and like I shared from the beginning, um, we only do it with residential members. So if you're like a visiting monastic or if you haven't really spent time with us for over six months, we we wouldn't encourage um, um, you to have shining light because we don't know you deeply enough. So there is a real depth to this practice, and the intention of the of our shining light sessions is to truly support one another. And like the text, like we vow to use the methods of loving speech, that every word we speak will come from the good intention of wanting to have a correct view and also to shine the light so that that person can see their blind spot. And when when we do it collectively, like in the upper hamlet, um, I know every monastery, we have this Dhamma door and every monastery will do it uh, in the appropriate way and setting. For example, because we have 50 something monastics, so we divide our um, um, brothers group into two into two groups but we divide evenly between the elder and younger so every group has senior members as well as the youngest member um, so there is a shining light and a deep listening from the multi-generational um, experienced practitioners in our community and with the presence of elders that are there it also has an impact so a lot of sessions when we go to, not everybody will have an opportunity to speak because each member only gets 45 minutes. So it's also a training for the whole community to be very precise in a very loving way and, and to truly articulate our offering guidance. And we always start with the flowers. Like in some... In some places, there's even like a rule. It's like you have to have three flowers before um, one mud or <laughs> or one suggestion mm -hmm. it, it, because it can't be true that you only see something negative about that person. So there is a deep um, development that is being happen, um, that is happening is that you have to reflect and review also your perception if it is correct or not. And 
if you only see that person's um, negative aspect, then it also reflects towards you that you really haven't lived with this person because you can only see their negative side when we all know we have good seeds in us. This is the truth. This is a fact. Our experience in this practice and my experience in this practice is very humbling. Number one, the one who is being received, who is um, getting the shining light, is a real practice of humility. You're learning to put all your shield down and to let the Sangha shine the light towards you. And you have to practice openness. And isn't this our deepest aspiration as Zen practitioners or as Buddhists to practice no self? It is to see all of the different elements that is not us or that we think is us. But our community can can shine the light where the weeds are <laughs> or where the strong branches that we have grown um, the wonderful leaves and flowers that, that have ripened and the fruits that have come to be thanks to our practice. And very interestingly, and I, I, I want to share a continuous development in this practice of shining light, is through the years, um, the community have developed, continued to develop the practice that before the Sangha shines light on the individual, we would ask the individual to shine light on themselves. So before we just come in and listen, but now we've taken another step and we've asked the individual to be in front of the community, your community, and to shine light on his or herself and to look at his or her own growth in the year, the wonderful qualities that they see in them, and then the practice that they are still developing or the shortcomings within habits or energies that they are still learning to transform. And then at the end, to request the community to shine light. So this practice is mandatory in our, in our community building. And the element of requesting the community to shine light on oneself, it is you verbalizing that I am here and I am open to receive your light. So please shine light. So we always say in, in Zen, in meditation, it's like the transmitter and the transmission, uh, the transmission and the receiver have to be one and there have to be a, a willingness from both sides. So this practice has also developed our vulnerability as we've discovered in this podcast, that vulnerability is a strength to understanding, to seeing, to, to accepting and acknowledging oneself. And very interestingly, in a lot of the self-shining light that I get to listen to my brothers share, it's so easy for one to just talk about their negative, pra uh, their negative habits. It's so easy to just see ourselves as someone not good enough. Even some brothers, when they shine light, the brothers would ask, brother, can you please identify at least two good qualities that you see in yourself? Ah. And in a way, but when we listen to the individual, we get to learn more about them, about the complexes that they go through. And then sometimes in some shining light, the individual feels ready. They ripen in the community. So every person's growth in a community like ours and I, I would say like in a relationship outside it takes time to root we take time to uh, for our roots to deepen in our relationship so there's some darkness or there's some past that we we don't share yet to the community because we're not ready and because something that we're still trying to understand as well as um, accept in ourselves. So in some of the our shining light sessions, it's the most profound moment when I get to know a brother because they're willing to go deeper in their own journey and they get to expose that and they get to share that and be transparent about it to the community. And when you get to listen about about somebody's suffering, 
we learn that when we understand somebody's suffering, our compassion arises. And so in a way of like this practice in this development of your journey with the community, it's also an opportunity to ask for support. So by sharing your suffering, your deepest aspiration, your need, and in this moment, you're not greedy at all. It's, it's, it's Like I said, it's very humbling. You even feel naked in front of the community. So when you expose and you share with that intention, in a way, it's like renewing your vows. It's like renewing your aspiration. Yeah, but brother, there's something so powerful about um, about people. Well, you know, there's a phrase, radical transparency, that what people are most afraid of is often where their salvation lies. So you may not want to admit to something or to having a difficulty with something and you feel, you know, shame or fear of isolation or of humiliation. But when you're present, and especially in a community like this, and in a sense, you're taking your heart out and offering it in your palms of your hand saying, here's my heart. Then all people want to do is to support you and to love you through that. Whereas when you're hiding from something, you're actually adding to the power of that feeling of negativity. And also, brother, that sense of um, how difficult it is for us to be kind to ourselves. So, um, you know, as you say, you know, the how easy it is for people to pick on the negative rather than the positive. And so the fact is that through this process, they have to say something positive and you have to say something positive is such a powerful thing. Um, I remember when I was, uh, I was once coaching a deputy headmaster of a, of a big secondary school in the UK. It was about 1,300 students, really big school, very senior guy. And, um, and I was coaching him and, and, and he was dealing with some insecurity. So I, I, we had a big sheet of paper in front of us. And I said, well, okay, can you list, just write down now your strengths, what you like about yourself. And he sat there for five minutes. And he said, I can't think of anything. He could literally could not write something down. And this was someone in a senior position, a teacher, a deputy head teacher. And then he really struggled. And then I said, well, write down what your students and teachers say your qualities are. And effortlessly started writing things down. So that speaks to the fact that even when we find it difficult to find it in ourselves, to hear it from other people is a real sort of balm to the soul. But brother, one thing, that, so there are a few questions coming to mind. So one is around power dynamics. So again, if you look uh, in uh, the world of business, for instance, or organization, traditional organizations, um, the ability of a very junior person to, um, to offer this radical transparency to a very senior person feels often like it's filled with, uh, with uh, it's like walking across a minefield. And even if you say it gently and kindly, the perceived risk is that you're going to be punished. Now, um, even though um, Plum Village, you know, has that deep sense of community building, there are elders, there are <coughs> novices who have just come into the practice. There is a dynamic going on there. So how do you work to allow someone who has a strong wish to offer an elder uh, some shining light, but is actually worried that, oh, that's the end of my monkdom, I'll be kicked out. Good question. <laughs> you want the juicy story? <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, so um, like I shared, like this practice has gone on a journey. So we've had, we've, we've definitely had monks who were very upset at one another f f um, by receiving particular shining lights or, or perceptions and judgment. And through the years, like we we we've really developed 
the facilitators have to be very stable and solid because the facilitator is hold, is holding the space for everyone. So we always start with three sound the bell and then in between each person we would invite another sound the bell just to recollect everyone. And like um maybe those who have never been to Plum Village or is new to our tradition, the bell the bell in our monastery it it is very well respected when you listen to the bell everybody stops what they're doing what they're saying and comes back to their breath and recollects themselves so the bells are essential they are the foundation for all of our meetings all of our um big sessions um deep listening sessions shining light or even dhamma talks and so on so the bell master has to be very present in the shining light sessions when they hear a particular sharing where it's not coming from love but it's coming from very sharp judgment and very um maybe it comes with an energy of blame the bellmaster has the the right to to ask it's like dear brother is this coming from blame or is this coming from judgment um check your energy where this is coming from i've done this as a bellmaster there was one brother who was receiving shining light and this person started off very good <laughs> had three uh three <laughs> follow the rules follow the rules you know of course the rules are to be broken right <laughs> so they they have three um three good qualities but then they prepared a like a list of seven or 10 negative points to um to share but it wasn't coming from love and coming to want to help that person it was just saying i don't like it when you do this and the energy right away it's not of the spirit of shining light and we do it as a sangha so members in the community also can ask the individual who is shining light is like dear brother can you articulate more or can you expand more on on that um on that um, perception or on that view or on that light that you offer. If some of us feel it's a little bit off, we can even counter that. So the beauty of doing it together, like if it's anonymous, then there's no responsibility. But when we're doing it as a community, when we call it the Sangha I, so each and every one of us who is listening to the, the brother or the sister offering the shining light, we get to also check if that story is correct. So there has been also sessions when um, Brother A shares one view, but Brother B, C, and D actually knows of that story, but that was a one-time thing. And it's not something to label that person with. So we offer the shining light, even to the one who is shining light. So it's a it's a really a live session. It's, it's it's a very it's very dynamic in a way, and it really shows um, the care that we have. So we make sure that the view is correct, and we've also been trained to to always ask if our perception is correct, and also to when we offer the shining light, if it's something that we are not sure. Don't share it because if it's not sure, don't don't voice it yet. Then it because it then it becomes an action, right? So in these sessions, it is it is true that because we're all being asked to look deeply, so maybe we might dig a little bit deeper and we maybe remember something. But it can also come like three years ago. But now it's the present moment. Are we sure that that person is still like that? And because we have a whole week or even more to to think of of the person whom is going to be offered guidance, we can also check our perception. Um, yes, the it is true that uh, there is a 
careful treading when we do offer guidance to our elders. Um, and some of it, yes, there's some fear, and some of it is respect, and some of it is also how sure are we about it. But if the space is there and the energy is very embracing and the dynamic of that that brother's characteristic, we know he is very open. He is able to receive. As a member of the Sangha, this is our practice. This is also learning to trust our wisdom and to trust our deep looking. And um, sometimes we can also share, but halfway through, we feel we want to take it back. It's also okay. So there's another element that is happening in the Shining Light is each group has a typewriter, has a somebody on, on the laptop writing everything that's being shared and is being projected on a screen or 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 is being projected via a TV. So we get to see everything that is written. And at the end of each, each session, before we end, we would invite the community to review again everything that has been um, shared and written and to check one more time, are these views correct? So, so we do like multiple layers of double checking. And even for myself, just a week ago, I, I offered shining light to a brother. And by the end of it, I felt that this was just my perception. And I, I feel because I am the abbot and I'm such an, an elder brother. So I feel like my, this perception can be quite heavy. And I said, I would like to take that back because I feel it's not fair because this is just my perception um, and, and not to have it written down. And I, I, I would ask the brother to also let go of that perception that I shared because I, I reflected and I saw that not many um, brothers echoed that as well as not many brother even shared in the same lane about that particular habit. So you get to also learn that, oh, okay, this is maybe just my own wrong view or just a view that I have and it's probably not accurate. So it's it's a real study. It's a real deep, deep dive into community building and to to also check the energy of how we are how we are producing um, the words and the um, the angle at where how we're trying to help that person. So it's it's it takes a lot of mindfulness and a lot of love and care in the words we choose also. Thank you, brother. And uh, as you were talking, uh, you know, one one particular point you make that I just want to accentuate is because, of course, by hearing about this practice, we can bring this in every day into our conversations. But one thing in particular you said was that when somebody acts in a certain way once, we very easily believe that that is who the person is. And I remember when I was at the Guardian and we went through the training for the feedback. And I remember the trainer saying, if, and they gave the example of, if you come into the office for the first time as a new boss, for instance, and you walk into the office and one of the journalists has his feet up on the table and is sort of pushing back in his chair and you walk past and you can very quickly form the judgment that, that person is lazy. And that the way the mind works is even if that person then works very hard, but occasionally you might see that person sort of going for an early lunch or going for a long lunch, that the way the mind works is that it will just pick on those things and say, well, you see, that person is lazy. So I really like the way you said that the community, the 360, is not just for the person receiving the feedback, but also for the people giving the feedback. Because actually, you have to be very responsible and um, and have to really n have thought it through and understood the, the consequences 
of what you're saying. So actually, what it does is holds everyone responsible and accountable um, for what they say. Yes, and we have like a guideline of like criteria to look at. So it's not just like we come into a session and we're like, shoot away your light, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Armor up. (laughs) Yeah, like, you know, community boundaries are really important. Um, And pathways, creating pathways so that we have a a clear path to walk together is is really important. So for our community, we, we use the four pillars of the monastic training, which is the first one is our... It's the individual's um, practice, meditations, um, ways of conducting oneself in the community through the practice, you know, how they take care of their emotions, how they take care of their um, daily activities, how they open the door, how they close the door. We really focus on the day-to-day things because we live together so intimately that it reviews our mind. So we would re- reflect on that person's individual practice. And then the other one is the, their study, like their openness to learn. Because all of us are students. Uh, when we enter into the monastic training, we, we have to like relearn everything. Like from the simplest of like, just how to drink a cup of tea and be present, you know, or how to listen how to share um how to work together and as well as the dharma how we study the dharma are we always present for the classes and what is our attitude towards studying and it can go very deep and our community is very diverse so we have those who are so intelligent and love studying picks up like four languages in like three years and it's, it's, it's just very encouraging. So when we listen to, to, to the shining light and we hear of individuals' um, willingness to learn, it's just incredible. You, then as an individual listening, you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm really slacking off on that, on that end. Like I need to up my game there, you know? And then the third element is uh, service and community life. Like, are we selfless while being in a community like Plum Village? Because that's our second Dhamma seal, which is learning to be a drop of water in this river, to go as a river. So the practice of living in harmony with each other, how we, uh, are we an individual player or are we a team player? And we have one brother who always uses sport metaphors and it's great. <laughs> He's like, if we are a, if we are a soccer player, if we are a soccer team, a football team, you're, you are definitely messy, you know? <laughs> but from time to time, you know, I think you should share the ball a little bit more, you know? And it's, it's just so, um, everybody finds skillful ways to paint a picture of an individual. And today, today sharing, um, there was a brother who, who one of the image that uh, the community painted for him is like, dear brother, you, you're like a calm lake. Every time you show up, your presence is just so calming and it helps the collective. It helps the, the OT team, organizing team. You don't even have to do anything. You just need to be there. And we feel that there is stillness and stability in the group. So by hearing all this, it's also we're watering each other's seed that we have. Oh, like, yeah, it's true. That brother has such stability. And we can see because he's so disciplined. So I'm lacking there. How, how do I cultivate that so I can also have more of that presence, for example? So it's also a mirroring for each other in these shining light sessions. And then the fourth one is generating joy and happiness. Are we able to, as an individual, take care of our happiness? And then take care of the happiness of the Sangha. Because our, our aspect is not just ourself, but how it has an impact on everyone. And for some, we need them to take care more of their, of their happiness because they do everything for the community. And sometimes they may spread themselves so thin that and we don't want to lose them. We don't want them to burn out because we have had monastic burnout in our community and 
end up leaving the Sangha. So we've also learned through our 42 years of Plum Village where we have a lot of experience, living experience, where we can shine light on one another. Sometimes we just say, because it hasn't happened yet, it's just like in our experience, if you keep going down this path, um, you may burn out, dear brother, and you are so dear to us, like, please take care of yourself. So in these moments of, of, of shining light, um, we, we also get to care for that person's future also. And, and we know that it's not an individual matter, like that person's presence and success is our presence and success. That person's shortcoming is also our shortcoming. And sometimes I hear when I listen to somebody's suffering or somebody's struggle, I also ask back, like, what haven't we done to support that person? Or it also reflects on the community that, oh, you know, in the last year, we haven't been diligent in reminding our community in this aspect. Therefore, this energy has emerged within individuals in our community. So like Thai's text says, like shining light for one is shining light for all. So by looking at one, you get to also look at the collective. So it's it's a real interbeing um practice and process and another element that is not is not in the written out criteria but a lot of us we always talk about is the friendship of the of the of the person's capacity in in developing communities and connection in the sangha meaning there are those who are are learning to live together so we just want to identify it's like I know maybe your whole life you've been solo. You've had your own room, you had your own house, you know, you had your own career, and here you are, like learning to unlearn all that and to really be in harmony. And just to acknowledge something as simple as that, it it is also it boosts that person's um um trust and faith in the path that they've taken. And uh, and in the willingness to to learn to be each other's friend, um, because we are a community, and we do live with one another. <laughs> we, especially in Upper Hamlet, we live in a in a resident that is like a square. It, it is a square, so we we see each other. The moment we step out of our room, we see each other. Like going to the restroom, going to the library, going to the zendo. So there's no way that we. We don't connect. And our teacher um, created the monks resident in that way so that we don't isolate ourselves. But nevertheless, we know that everybody's journey takes time in getting rooted in our community. And friendship is one of the four gratitudes that we, we learn to acknowledge, be mindful of, and pay gratitude towards. And friendship, they always say, to be successful on any journey, you need good friends to support you. And it's very true for the monastic path. And that's why shining light is also another key practice where we get to be more intimate in the openness and in the... um the courage to also point out things that we recognize um, that they're stuck at. And sometimes it's painful to say, but it's because I love you. That's why I say it. Because really, if I don't love you, I'm not going to say anything. I won't care about you. So in the shining light, it also reveals many things. So some brothers, like, th- like there's no gap in between, in between sharings. Because everybody has something to offer, whether they're flowers or whether they're suggestions. And the reality is, and there's some shining light, you can hear the crickets because that person is not so integrated in the community. So they're, even in that, that is shining light. It reveals how, how much you isolate yourself from the community or how much maybe the relationship um, that folks don't feel fully comfortable in offering. So it's a very dynamic and unique 
experience. It does, and and one of one of the things I'm hearing so clearly in what you're saying is, it's the chance to go beyond the belief in self, which is of course the core <laughs> Buddhist understanding of interbeing. Because because often, you know, you'll get people in a you know their community, which might be an organization or whatever, and thinking they think, how can I do well here? How can I, you know, everyone wants to be a messy in that sense. You know, everyone wants to, um, they, they think of themselves as, as at the extent of their border, that's who they need to look after. Whereas actually what I'm hearing is that actually, if every person represents a facet of the whole, then actually the whole has to be understood as the whole. Is that, in other words, my contribution to the whole might be I'm very good at this. It doesn't mean I have to also be good at that and that because someone else is, if someone else is calm as a lake, yes, of course I want to develop calmness, but my skill may be that I'm good at accounting and I look after the bookshop finances. And actually that is of equal importance within the life of a community and, that, and seeing someone else be calm is also my calmness. And for that person who's calm, they're able to be calm, maybe in part because they don't have to do the accounting in the bookshop. So, so, so what I'm hearing is that it's 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 a deep way of seeing beyond self and to actually what really is a community. Yeah, and and with the sangha, I like we we like a dharma teacher would a lot of us we would be attentive to shining the light on how he or she offers the teaching. Or how he or she shows up, and and in the shining light, you also get to see the different layers of our community, like you have expressed, and yeah, it's so beautiful to to hear like what is very meaningful for people. It's not when you give like an incredible dharma talk, but what I always hear is like when when people are attentive and caring for each other. Like we we have a brother who we call we call him the. Um, the rice bodhisattva, the rice soup bodhisattva, because he does not discriminate. When anybody is sick, he makes rice soup for them. <laughs> and it's always in the common room. And even the non-sick brothers get to enjoy the, the, <laughs> the rice soup. And, and uh, just, yeah, two years ago, our brother returned back to Vietnam. So we're, we're, we're definitely missing our rice soup bodhisattva. So this is a call out to <laughs> anyone who wants to be a monastic and makes good rice soup is side up now. <laughs> No, but you know, like this is just, and he's a Dharma teacher and he's, he's a brother who is not um, eloquent in speaking and doesn't like to be in the public and uh, gets very nervous and shy, but he knows that his offering is on the practical side. He, he does, he can build anything. And when anyone is sick, he's like, I'm there, I'm going to make you rice soup with ginger, with onion, don't worry about it, you know, and, and it just shows that there's so many ways of offering. And like you said, every offering is as important as uh, the ones who are writing books or are curating as well the ones who are cleaning the toilets, the ones who are sweeping the grounds. And this is where we get to break the the hierarchy of like what is important what is not and to really see that that interbeing because it's right like we can't do this podcast and have this total freedom if there aren't brothers and sisters who are cooking who are holding uh, other other elements in the community for example so this also in in this shining light it's also it's a it's a place and time to offer our gratitude you know to to show our appreciation of the individual. And and to prevent arrogance from developing. And I, I, I know, uh, again, when I because I was at The Guardian 23 years, and one of the projects I ran was called Living Our Values, which I ran for 15 years, which was about making sure that the values of the organization weren't just spread into the world, but were internalized. So, so one of the things was if we wrote something, had a view of something that we needed to make sure that we were living that, which is why I called it living our values. And and one of those was very much that sense that the journalists felt they were the most important people. They were brilliant intellects. They were writing great stories. They were reaching 
big audiences. They were making, you know, exposing wrongdoing. And, and of course, that is true. But their attitude was arrogant, many of them. Not, of course, not all of them. So the way sometimes the facility staff were treated, the cleaners or the people just keeping the building running or stopping the toilets from overflowing... And so one of my wishes was to equalize that, to say, well, no, actually, if you can't come into the, and this was before people could work from home, but if you, if you can't come into the building because the toilets are overflowing, there's no electricity, or the printers at the print works um, aren't around, you know, can't come into work, then, then you have no journalism. And, um, and to say that everyone is important. And I think, I think in, you know, what, what I'm, so many of the things I'm hearing you speak about, brother, you, you, my thought goes to, if only one of these aspects were brought into sort of um, in organizations outside the world, you know, in the, in the world, whether it's business or NGOs or government or, or institutions, just you could start to fundamentally shift people's relationships with each other and in the work they're creating in the world. And so actually... I, I see these lessons of being lessons for transforming our institutions, transforming our systems, rather than just a practice in Plum Village. That would be that would be amazing if there's some elements from the Shining Light practice that can be incorporated into team building and so on. And a fun fact that uh, this is this is the Damador how we um, accept aspirants to become novices or and novices to become a fully ordained monk or nun and then a bhikshu or bhikshuni becoming a dharma teacher so we don't do tests there's no like written text or there's no uh, a written test that you have to ace or or express your knowledge in a particular way because for us it's more important your way of being your way of contribution your way of of, gr of growth in the community that we, based on that, that we would be ready to embrace you into the monastic order or becoming a bhikshu or bhikshuni, which means a fully ordained monk or nun, or becoming a dharma teacher, which is having an opportunity to learn to be a, become a good teacher, a mentor, and grow in offering the dharma in the best capacity that we can. And by by doing it uh, with this um, with this sangha eye, we also avoid like like biases like that are, can be developed within within groups. Right? It's like if I'm gonna become a dharma teacher, then I'm just gonna like um, become like very sweet to you for the next like four months because <laughs> you're about to make my decision, right? But but we don't. We, we don't, we're not based on that and we're based on a collective view by shining light and we get to hear if that person is, we say, if that person is ripe. And we don't look for anybody perfect, but they, they're ripe enough to become a monastic or a, a fully ordained monastic or a Dhamma teacher. And Thay always says that when you become a Dhamma teacher, when you re when you receive the lamp, it doesn't mean you have accomplished anything. <laughs> it's actually it's just it's just the beginning. And he always says it takes like ten years to become a very good Dharma teacher. And even Dharma teachers, we yes, arrogance and ego and pride is also one of the hindrances of our freedom as a monastic. And as a practitioner, I would even say, for those of us who, you know, we can have a long term practice, but if we don't see our blind spots and if there are, if we don't have friends who can also shine light to help us grow then we might we might be stuck for a while and the shining light it happens officially once a year but shining light um, can happen throughout the year between mentors and mentees or very close brothers and sisters and uh yeah, from time to time, a group of us who are very close to each other, we would sit down and just shine light on each other. Or when we were growing as Dhamma teachers, like we would shine light on the way we um, offer the teachings or how we uh, facilitate, you know, 
um, we would take that brother aside and say, oh, brother, you did these elements were really good, but, you know, I want you to be more aware when you use the bell, for example, or when you're presenting uh, a subject to to be more concrete about it. So the shining light, um, it's it's really uh, also a tool and a way to support one another because to have language is important because sometimes it's just like here come here and let me tell you what you're not good at it sounds horrible but it's like brother can i shine light and when you hear that you know that there's something that you can improve but the language helps soothe the the process of growing So, brother, just wondering, uh, has a, it a, happened where, well, I'm sure it's happened, but that you know of where um, a monastic will receive a shining light, but come away feeling a bit aggrieved, yes. which is feeling that mm. actually, you know, yes, I hear that, but I genuinely feel that that was a misinterpretation. And um, because, of course, shining light is there to, to clean up things and to make an offering and but of course we're human and it can on occasion I imagine have the opposite effect where someone comes away feeling well actually um, I'm not understood uh, at all for um, what I'm doing um, or my contribution and I'm just wondering what is the uh, recommendation uh, for someone who may be going through that and, and have you had to um, sort of, in a sense, step in to support somebody. Yes, uh, that has happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, a really funny story. Uh, <laughs> we, we had one of our, um, one, one of our seasoned Dhamma teacher brother, um, one year was feeling very courageous. And he told the community, don't be afraid to shine light on me. Anything you see, just offer it. <laughs> oh, dear. Be I can imagine. You know that saying, right? Be careful what you <laughs> ask for, for wish for, for yeah. because, well, he kind of opened the gate. So we're like, all right, my, my brother's ready. And yeah, I think it was just the, the suggestion was too much compared to the, the flowers because... Also, in that moment, it's very rare, like you said, like um, it's a moment where we get to really shine light on our seniors. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think we, we got a little Open bit. Open the floodgates. We, we, we got a little bit greedy on that too, <laughs> and a little bit unmindful of the balance. Yeah. So, it's also the, the attentiveness that we didn't have in that moment of of to to balance and remember the the rules, which is like flowers three one right um and yeah some of us like did recognize like our brother was like oh, i was down for a few a few days or weeks and and yet yeah, the responsibility is also to come and and to check in and to say you know you asked for it <laughs> <laughs> but we love you you know brother like we, we truly love you and just to remind like you know there's that saying in Vietnamese is like if, if 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 you don't offer bitterness you know then that's not true love like because they always say like bitter medicine is like good for your your liver and good for your health um and and also the practice of the listener is just to be open and receive so this has also been developed in our Shining Light sessions is that the individual in that moment is not allowed to counter any suggestions that is being offered because then that is pride speaking in that moment and not real openness and and trust the community. Of course, like I shared it, it, we've we've done this process for a very long time now in our community. So there is 
a lot of maturity in in this in this practice of 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 speaking of sharing and of listening to one another and to help views if they're not totally accurate um we we did learn like before we did have brothers like in like after all the sharings they did bow and they said like i feel like the community or that view is so wrong and you don't understand me and maybe it's true because we, what we said like you it can be partially right but in that moment i feel and this is just my experience right so if you counter like that then suddenly nobody next year will want to shine light on you so there's a time and space for everything so in that moment of receiving and listening we always end with gratitude it's become i don't know about the other monasteries in our tradition but in upper hamlet we always end with each individual thanking the community uh, for shining light and and they always say i will take time to reflect on all the suggestions and i will learn to put it into practice and it's it's very genuine when when each individual shared this it's not like an automatic thing it's like i shared like the the atmosphere that has been set up is it's it's very tender it's very it's very real and it's the real heart that is being offered to one another so in that moment even if it's not 100% accurate but i think it's the intentions that are there that we're hearing from one another and we always offer gratitude back and yes maybe a week later you know we can share to our mentors like you know dear mentor like i was this was my shining light and i don't feel it's 100% accurate what do you think you know and then we can reflect on it but in that moment of like if you shut it if you shut the gates down then it also sh- in a way it just presents your your unwillingness to to be open yeah yeah brother just one one thing i'm holding in the back of my mind go for I, it no which i just want to come back to know it's a good thing <laughs> okay 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 <laughs> it's, a, it's a flower water um i was really impressed when you said that um with this one uh, monk that you thought about something and then went and said i want to take that back i, I just because i think there's that's such a beautiful expression of deep re- looking and reflection and then action and what was at the back of my mind was how was that received mm. because one thing because 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 it's not just in the saying of something it's the re- how the person receives that and how that changes their way of being and i'm so i'm just intrigued as to how that was received the brother smiled <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah like you know when we practice and we have intuitions that saying mm what i said there is not 100% accurate and and i was like Are, am i sure with that view and in that moment um I I just remember the teachings that says that words have weight on them especially when it comes from mm, particular relationships and I'm very aware of my of my relationship with my brothers and and I don't want words to become a prison or a view to become a prison and even though my intention was trying to point a particular view which I in my own perception uh, help them overcome but that's still just my perception and i just felt mm i've i've set a cage and i'm going to ask that person to in the year to 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 open it but maybe it's not true so let me free him from this and and when i did that in my heart i felt really light so i believe that his heart also felt very light. Mm. Brother, so one of the well actually the main purpose for this podcast is uh that as we discover Thai's teachings 
and the way they're practicing the monastery that people can then say, oh, I wonder how I can incorporate that into my daily life. So um, what's your suggestion for, because there, there are moments where this is very appropriate and there can be also moments where it's very not appropriate and uh, and it can go down like a lead balloon. So I'm just wondering, I mean, you, you've talked a lot about the conditions that are necessary. So there needs to be sort of a sense of openness and and and, a, and a, it's it's not I'm going to give you shining light sit there and take it so it has to be something that is consensual in that sense but I'm just wondering if this is something that uh, can be used effectively in relationships in when in one-to-one working conditions within teams because because while there are clearly some, I mean, I can immediately see how some of these, um, some of the ways you do this practice would very well uh, translate into the real world. There, there are also risks because, because the world outside the monastery has different cultures, different fears, different, um, different power structures. Um, so I'm just wondering, and I know this is a very general question, and so should be taken as a general question, but what's your suggestion about how effective you've have you come across good examples where this is um used in the in the world beyond the monastery very effectively or all moments where someone's come back to you and said i tried that it was a disaster so just get a general sense of how we can translate aspects of this not of course not the whole thing necessarily but aspects of this into the real world oh i definitely think it can um we don't have to tell the people that this is a Damador from Plum Village and I need you to sit down and breathe three times and <laughs> and then boom, 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 boom. Um, but I think the essence of it is, is, is love, which is showing our support and shining light where there are blind spots. And like I shared, like we only do this in the residential community where there is a real relationship, intimate, mm, kind of intimacy you know that we 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 really know each other and because i i feel if we don't have this damador for example um i feel the tendency as individualistic living we can not care about the the other person and just say oh you know what like that's just his habit i'm just gonna let him go down that rabbit hole and and i'm just gonna be better than that and to be honest, it's it's very easy to do that. It's harder to offer input. It's harder to to shine the light so that that person can see when you know that by that person doing that continuously, they suffer. Of course, do not use it as as a weapon to shame somebody. So, for example, we have. I mean, I have a policy that I made for myself is to never do it in front of public. Even if that that individual does something in front of everyone, and in my mind, I said, "Oh, that was so poorly done." I'm not going to go up there and correct um, the person in front of everyone, right? Even though you can say, "This is shining light. This is my responsibility as an elder, or you know, as his mentor." No, no there's a time and moment for everything. Skillfulness is so important, and the essence of this is in real friendship or in real relationship according to um to my understanding and my own experience in in relationship is is having the time and space to acknowledge the flowers as well as to support one another when we see a particular habit or tendency it may be a view it may be mm, an action that is always occurring and if you don't fix it or if you don't support it for it to change it will become thick and heavy and you may look down the road and say oh my god if two years ago i said that and i shared to that person to be mindful of that tendency then that person could have um not gain an a habit or or on the other end is to water the good seeds in them. It's like, you know, like let that person know of these wonderful qualities that they have so that they can continue to develop and grow those qualities. And I was, you know, reflecting on myself and 
like I, we all have complexes, right? And depending on our growth and depending on our childhood, um, you we remember like all the moments when we were told we're not good enough. But when when you hear something, and it's as simple as, you know, when you smile, brother, you make the whole room smile. Like that's a very wonderful quality. And I received this when I was a young novice and it added, it added like an experience that I've never experienced before, which was um, being acknowledged for a simple action that can help brighten the room. And that for me has laid a, a very strong foundation as one of my thread in the fabric of who I am <laughs> that I always remember of the smile, for example. So shining light also has the has the impact of creating um, the wonderful characteristic of a human being that we can help water that seed in them so that they can grow and develop. So um, I have my wife Paz here. So you get it once a year, brother. I get it every day. <laughs> The good seeds. Which is the good seeds and also the suggestions. And, uh, and of course, when, you know, when you, what you say is so it's all about the intention and the love. Because when the love and the intention is present, actually, then we can hear things. Because even though we can be very critical of ourselves, we find it very difficult when someone else is saying it to us. So actually, it's always about how are we showing up. Um, and my final question, brother, I keep the best till last. Yes, is, yes, yes. Um, we have been talking about the community and about going beyond self. But how is your, have you had your shining light this year? I did. And would you like to <laughs> <laughs> expose it I, to the world? I, 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 I'm sure you knew this was coming at some point. But uh, would you like to share anything? from it and uh, being this is a public space of course um we talk about healthy boundaries and everything but but um how did it you know how was it and and also i'm sure you you you've had it for the past you know 21 years or so you know are, do you notice patterns because often you know i have habits that you know even though i've been aware of them i still they still come up and, and because habits are very difficult to fully let go in certain situations you know as we know with the buddhist model of the mind a certain situation will happen and, and an old seed will pop up from our store consciousness into our mind consciousness so so none of us are aiming to be perfect or can be perfect but i'm just wondering from a personal perspective whether you want to share anything about your own process in it mm. we'll allow a long silence here breathing in breathing out <laughs> In the spirit of uh, interbeing, uh, there's nothing to hide. <laughs> um, yes, I have received. I, I I received two shining lights, and one is f officially from the community, and one from um, a group of friends that are not monastics. So yes, it can happen uh, outside of the outside of the. Um, the community settings and let me talk first about uh, the community's shining light um, yeah it's always very vulnerable to s be in front of the community and enjoy my palms and and just share because in that moment I don't want to be faking anything and I don't want to be um, also like uh, bypassing anything because I know the Sangha sees everything. And this year, my focus when I look back on myself was heart of service compared to demand and expectation and uh, needs. And I realized that I was, I was walking the path in the last few years from the space of 
I just have to do this or else nobody does this. Mm. And and I was slowly losing my my love for the community, you know, and I said it's very hard to say this, but it was I, I had to be honest to myself because that's my own shining light to myself and to have the Sangha to witness this. Um so that was quite vulnerable of me of saying in front of, of my brothers and in in this group of brothers is from eldest to youngest so like those who just ordained like a few weeks ago and i was just like this is who i am and and asking the community to shine light on me um the, the one pattern that has been coming for many years is like I am a busy monk <laughs> and I w w one of my freedom this year was actually I really accepted that and and I'm okay with that I'm happy with that because if I can do these works where it's not everybody's favorite administration work and lots of meetings where I have to skip a lot of meditation session with the Sangha um, on the phone a lot in, on emails a lot so if I can do this so that four brothers don't have to do this it's okay I feel I feel this is my offering and I think before I was a little bit shameful about that like shameful that I whenever somebody sees me the, you know, the first thing they say is, I know you're very busy, brother. But if there is just, you know, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, um, that was one thing that I've, I've actually, I've accepted. This is where I'm at right now for this community. And I, I do it, I do it well. <laughs> and, and, and I'm happy about it. And thanks to that, through that acceptance, I'm able to create boundaries. So I'm, okay to say no now um, when somebody wants to spend time with me and and I said actually you know what I'm very full I can't and I would like to ask for your understanding so before I was more like trying to like people please everybody um, yeah so there's this one friend who like requested to see me uh, like right after arriving in Plum Village, I'm just, bro, you just arrived. Like, you know me. Like, if you listen to the podcast, there's nothing more for me to say. Um, but uh, but he's here for the whole three months and I said, just be patient. If you're patient, the moment will come. <laughs> and I think it's just the acceptance of my reality was was a new freedom for me. So, and a lot more was, was shared in The Shining Light, but I think that's enough for the world to to hear and and to go to another layer of you know friends that I've I've established through the community a, a huge shout out to to my two friends part of my we call each other the three lines to support each other like diamond or whatever lines we 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 create in order to to be listening and sharing from the heart um yeah this year in a conversation I had with with them and Sometimes when it's not with monastics, I, like I can, I can be a little bit more free because <laughs> I don't have to be, you know, the Fap Hu or, or Brother Fap Hu or Tai Fap Hu. I can just be me, um, and I'm very grateful for the bonds that we've created to to have that freedom. And I asked them because the year was ending, so I asked them. Well, I kind of played. I I kind of dug my own <laughs> my own hole, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Do you think I'm free enough?" That was my question, my genuine question. And one of them was like, "Um, you want me to be honest?" I'm like, "Yes, of course. This is this is like this is our our commitment to one another." And my friend said, "Actually." I don't think you're fully free. And honestly, I was really shocked by 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 uh, this reply from from my good friend. And my other friend who was also on the call, um, 
she was like nodding her head like in full agree agreement and i was like what you too <laughs> and and i of course i said you need to elaborate more you need to say more because we all say freedom is freedom of something and yeah my friend was just saying that when i look at you i see that you you check all the boxes that plum village asses you know like uh uh an abbot, a role model, a facilitator. You do the podcast. You, uh, um, you're good friends. People love you. Like you check all these boxes, and because of of your relationship with Tai and how things unfold, you you became abbot. You're abbot during his time that he was still teaching. There's a lot of trust and a lot of love that is given to you, but comes with a lot of responsibility. So we only know Fap Hu, or I only know you as what we expect from you. So my question is, what is Fap Hu without all of this? And that was really huge when she she shared this to me. And uh, it really, like it was a cold plunge <laughs> in a way, it, like shocked the whole system. Because I didn't have an answer, because I don't know. So it, like in a way, like I am so, I'm so good at swimming in this river, that if you remove the river, how would I move? That was my own reflection. So this is my, my own contemplation uh, for the coming year, um, my own real inner freedom. Not saying that there's no freedom in in what I'm doing now. Like I do this podcast and share from freedom. I, I'm still here from freedom, but to go even deeper into this as, as, a, as, yeah, as my, how is Tai saying like, my life is my message? Like what is my message for my life? And that has the impact to all, of course. So that is a shining light that was done, you know, just through, friends on a on on a on a video call and just being honest and being and I was just listening you know and I I I my presence I think because I was so open and they were uh, able to share fully and I never interrupted and I I actually just wanted to hear more because there are sides that we we may not see in ourselves brother thank you for that because this is a living example of what we've been talking about my heart opens to you wider and um and i love you more and i appreciate you more and um because i you know i have this sense of who i think you are and you're, you're you know you you have this extraordinary gift and offering and um and i know that by you asking this question that gift and offering will grow and deepen and it will become from an action into a presence and that you will be able to be present in a way that people will find refuge and find support and find their own answers so you are in a sense growing this big oak tree that that will provide shelter for many species many people so um so i am here for you brother i know you're there i'm very happy I know you suffer, and that is why I am here for you. And uh, I suffer too. <laughs> Please help. <laughs> so we've just done uh, the four mantras of our one of our recent recordings. So, um, brother, thank you, because I, I genuinely feel that there are deep lessons for us all in this sharing, in how we want to show up ourselves in the world, how we open up ourselves to deep questions, how we are there for other people in a skillful way of being able to show people aspects of themselves that they're not aware of, but not in a way that frighten them or close them down, but in a sense that is a gift and an offering. So thank you, brother. And thank you, Joe. I just want to take the opportunity to water your flowers. Uh, thank you so much for um, creating this podcast with me because it, many listeners may not know, but Joe was the last condition for this man, uh, for this podcast to really manifest. And I, I'll never forget that moment walking down the new path. And I said, Joe, 
I need some coaching. How do you ask? How do you ask questions as a journalist? And Joe, you're like, why don't we do this together? And boom, the way out is in was born. But uh, beyond the podcast is also your unconditional support and love. I've always felt it. I always know that you are there, um, and uh, your openness and your also vulnerability that you've been able to share to me throughout uh, the years that we've been together and on the path and uh, always lovely to have your support and just to know that there's somebody I can rely on that's a greatest gift so you are one of my shining stars in my life and I just want you to know that thank you thank you and I will do my best to shine brightly for you <laughs> thank you brother Dear listeners, we hope you benefit from this podcast and find some way to integrate it into your own life. Um, there are many other lessons we can learn from uh, Brother Fapu's sharings over the past couple of years. So if you want to get in touch with those, you can find all of our previous episodes on the Plum Village app and also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and all other podcast platforms. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to The Way Out is In podcast on the platform of your choice and if you are, feel able um it would be wonderful if you can leave a review so as a trail for other people to find us and you can also find all previous guided meditation in the on the go section of the plum village app this podcast is co-produced with global optimism and the plum village app with support from the taking hand foundation if you feel inspired to support the podcast moving forward please visit tnhf.org slash donate and we want to thank our friends and collaborators today Nick as our sound engineer as well as Paz present here giving spiritual support and support to Joe to Clay co-producer aka the podfather as well as Kata our co-producer and our creator of the Plum Village app as well as our other Joe audio editing and cut our show notes and publishing jasmine and cindy our social media garden angels and thank you everyone for listening thank you is in.